So let me pull this up. Okay. So, I don't know. I think I did that wrong. So share. There we go. Okay, hopefully this will work. If not, I'll fix it. Okay, so thank you. So today we're going to talk about virtual learning because I know this has been our reality now. We've had COVID for a almost a year in our lives. Everyone's had to make a lot of adjustments. And so we'll, some children are back in school, some children are still virtual. So let's go through a lot of this. But just to start with, I guess, I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist at Joe DiMaggio, and most people have no idea what a pediatric neuropsychologist is. So if you've never heard of it, that's fine. I'll just give you a very brief spiel. Um, so my doctorate is in psychology. My specialty is neuropsychology, which is the brain behavior relationship. So what I do is, is testing essentially with kids. So I see children with different medical conditions from the age of six months up until they're in their mid twenties. And so with the little ones, it's the neurodevelopmental eval, looking at early milestones, what they're meeting, motor, language, overall cognitive abilities. And then with the more comprehensive neuropsych, when children are older, it's looking at IQ, language, memory, attention, executive functioning, motor skills, academics, emotional behavioral, everything like that. Because what I see is kids who have medical conditions or medical treatment that impacts the brain. So anyways, that is my background for what I do. So we're going to talk about virtual learning, except somehow my, there we go. Okay, it wasn't moving. All right, so we've been at this a year. I don't know that anybody feels like an expert in any way. I know I certainly do not. I think things are changing. We still are in this state of what's coming next. What, what's, what's going to be the normal in a month, in six months, next school year? And I think there's still a lot of unanswered questions with COVID, with the vaccine. Some of us have been able to get the vaccine already, but what does that mean? Do How long are we vaccinated for? Do we need a booster? Um, and with these new strains coming out, and then what happens with the kids? When will we have a vaccine for kids? So there is a lot of uncertainty. So, you know, I think we all need to take it day by day, but hopefully there'll be some strategies or some things within this presentation that might be helpful to you. So how to turn your home into a school without losing your sanity. I mean, how many of us, if you do have your kids at home and maybe you're working from home or maybe you're just a stay-at-home parent, I mean, how many times have you looked around and thought, oh my goodness, okay, I'm, you know, I'm trying to work from home and I have 5 million things that I need to organize with that. But I also have no idea what my child is supposed to be doing on their computer. And then I look around and I see laundry that is done but not folded and put away because I don't have time for that. And then there's, you know, the food all over the floor for my 16 month old because she threw food to the dog and I don't have time to clean up that right now either. And there's too much and it just kind of spirals out of control. So I think this is overwhelming for a lot of us even now. And I think we all need to, you know, big thing today is just giving ourselves grace, taking a deep breath whenever you need to, trying to go with it and realizing, I don't think anybody has the perfect solution. None of us are perfect at this. We are still just learning as we go. Okay. So this is absolutely impacting the kids, right? After summer breaks, and it's just a typical school year, non-COVID, many students lose 30 to 50% of the skills that they learned the previous year in reading and math. So we have the statistics that show that. And then in the new school year, they need to relearn some of that, which goes quicker because it's they've already learned it before, but there's still that gap, right? So now we have kids who, if they're still virtual learning, you know, they were out of school last year in March and they were home and then home for the summer. There was no summer school programs. And then starting the school year and maybe they were in the classroom, maybe it's virtual, but learning is completely different now. And so it's we, we do not need to panic. We don't know the long-term outcomes, but I, we do not need to think, okay, they, they're having sixth grade year virtual. That means they're never going to college or doing whatever else they want to do after graduation. Let's not panic. There's, there's plenty of time for them to catch up. Everybody needs to do things differently. And try to remember, this is not going to last forever. I know I don't think people expected it to last this long, but eventually we will be, be out of this. 
okay? This is also impacting the parents. So parents are in a less structured space. There's new pressures where they need to be the, the co-teacher now at home or the headmaster, but they're also juggling all of the other responsibilities they already had. So balancing the demands of the virtual learners and then the children's emotional adjustment, which we can't overlook. And so families are really under one literal and virtual roof and just trying to keep up with things. And your know, parents have really had to quickly pivot, rework schedules to meet job demands while also helping their kids. And even for those of us who had our kids go back to school when they were able to in October, I mean, raise your hand if your child's class has already had to quarantine. And then all of a sudden you have a week or two and your child has to be home. And now you're again, looking at your schedule thinking, I can't take off five, six days from work and cancel all of my patients. What are we gonna do and how do we split that? And what if you're a single parent and you don't have another parent to depend on or you can't take days off of work? You know, there is still a lot that is going on for all of us and we all need to be flexible and just try to keep that in mind as, as we work with each other. Other things that are coming up more and more now, screen time. Right? So if they're doing virtual learning, and some children for a while, I believe, were going back to school, but depending on their class or in the county or which school they were in, were still on the computer within the, the classroom. So when we think in general about screen time, too much screen time can lead to sleep problems, lower grades in school, reading fewer books, less time that they're spending with family and friends. They're not getting enough physical activity. They have leads to weight problems, it can lead to mood problems, poor self-image, body image issues, the fear of missing out, especially if they're just consumed with social media and so-and-so is doing that and I can't do that right now, and less time learning other ways to relax and have fun. So in general, screen time is not great, but what do we do when we're forced into it now? You know, excessive media use in children has been associated with a number of undesirable health outcomes, reduced sleep, like we talked about in increased obesity, language, and emotional delays with young children. When we look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, what they say is if children are two or under, they really shouldn't have any screen time other than video chatting, but there should be no other screen time. With preschoolers, no more than one hour of high quality programming per day, so something that's more academic or Sesame Street where they're learning something. With grade schoolers and teens, you know, they try to say don't let media displace other important activities such as sleep, exercise, family meals, and having that unplugged downtime. But for all ages, you know, really being a media mentor and have parents view media with your kids or just know what they're looking at and have parental controls in place that you need. But at this point, I think a lot of us are asking how will increased screen time impact development in the long run for the older children and adolescents, but even for the younger children? Because if you have a four-year-old in VPK and you chose the virtual option because for, you know, you're worried about them getting sick or maybe they're immunocompromised and it's just not safe to send them back to the classroom at this point, now they're just learning on the screen, they're on the screen for several hours a day. How is this going to impact them long-term? We don't have all the answers to that. Again, I think a lot of it is we have to do what we can to try to offset that. And we'll talk more about that. So what can we do? What do we need to be aware of? And what should we watch out for? So let's go over some of the things that are in our control. Oh. Okay. So again, there's a lot of unknowns. For those who have lost track, you know, today's Blur's Day, the 14th of Map Appleary. It's just, I think it's hard enough to know what season it is or month because we don't really have seasons here in Florida. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm used to change of scenery and I love that it's warm right now. But with that and then with everything thrown off with virtual learning and COVID, it's even harder to know what day it is, what time it is. It's everything kind of blurs together. But kids really adapt quite well. I think a lot of times they can adapt better than parents. So keep that in your mind that children will adapt. When you're home, you know, one of the things to do is that we encourage families is to set up a schedule, you know, but realize that it's a relaxed schedule. So at this point, a lot of you are probably into more of a routine because we've been doing this. If your child's been virtual learning for the year, hopefully you've been able to find something that works for you. Um, you know, and it's said that you only need two to four hours of really structured academic learning, depending on the age of the child. So in terms of what, what this little picture says, sleep in, that doesn't mean sleeping in until 10, 11, really late in the day. What that means more is 
during a normal school year, we have a lot of children who may have to wake up really early to get on a bus to make it to school. And they're just waking up at a really unnatural time for them. So maybe they can sleep in until 7, 7.30, 8, you know, trying to find what time they, they have to be there to start the school day um, online. And how, think about it, how long does it take them to get dressed, to eat breakfast, brush their teeth, to get ready to sit down and be ready? And, and figure out what works for them so that they are getting enough sleep, but then they're also not rushed. You know, trying to work, if depending what flexibility is in the schedule, work in other things. Maybe go out for a little walk in the middle of the day to help the child reset and to get away from that screen time. You know, because we do wanna watch out for screen overload. And so they're getting so much now because of the virtual learning that really try to make an effort to offset that at other times. You know, we don't want them to be on the laptop all day for academics and then kind of just zoning out in front of the TV all night. We really want to try to mix it up with different things, but, but try to find a schedule that's flexible that can work for you. So when we think about creating a schedule, you know, consistency matters. We want it to be clear and straightforward. Regular wake times and bedtimes are very important for kids. Even on the weekends, I wouldn't let that vary by too much. So we want them to be in more of a consistent rhythm. You know, during the summer months, we often see the sleep cycle get really shifted because then kids are staying up late. And now if they're doing virtual learning, I think that can be an issue sometimes as well. But again, really trying to prioritize sleep, know it's important and have that consistency. When you're making the schedule, find what works for you. Is it verbal? Is it visual? Do you make some fancy chart on the computer or do you just write out post-it notes and have it up? And you know, with post-it notes then you can move things around as you need to too. So there is a benefit to it. And some of us love our post-it notes. Uh, predictability matters though. Knowing what to expect can decrease anxiety. So when the child sees, okay, this is coming, that can also help them with their own adjustment because they know what to prepare for. And don't forget, it's not all work. So even if they're home right now for virtual learning, schedule in breaks that they need, schedule in movement, schedule in their meals. They can take a snack break. I wouldn't put out just a bowl of snacks and have them eat it all day long while they're sitting there, but schedule that in so they can take a little break. And try to get creative with what you're doing with them too. So it's not the same thing every single day. You know, understand the components, communicate with the teacher, um, and find out what, what teacher instruction do they absolutely need to be in front of the computer for? What time is circle time? Is there a morning meeting for older kids? What time do they absolutely have to log on? And help support their individual work as well. Again, depending on the age of the child. So, you know, you know your child the best. Find what works, periodic check-ins, make sure they're on task for what they need to do, make sure they understand what they need to do and that they're not confused or that they need help that they're not getting right now. Um, there's maybe some things again with younger students that it, it is more parent assisted. And so trying to find how that works for the child, but also for you as the parent where both of you can have that time. So some independent work and parent assisted instruction could possibly completed, be completed at different times during the day. So again, if you're working from home and there's things you need to do and it's a younger student, maybe taking a, a break at some point and then in the evening when you're done with your work day and you can sit down and spend more time with them, then maybe completing that project that they have. Okay, breaks are very important, but I always say work first and then break. That's what we do in my office. I have kids for hours. They're usually either here for a half a day or a full day. We work first and then we take breaks. So mini breaks, mini breaks with activity. So again, this will depend on the age of the child. If they're younger, maybe they need to work 10 minutes and then switch activities too. If you're switching um, to something else, it can help reset that attentional capacity. But if they're older, giving them time to get up, move around, get away from the computer for five or 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be that long. If they're younger, it can be even two to five minutes and just move around, sit down and then refocus. So if there's these favorite break activities that they have, try to save that for the end of the day. So that can be the big payoff. And pay attention to transitions, especially from a break. So watch the child and really understand like, are they able to sit down and transition back? Are there some things that help? Or are there some things that, that happen that then set off a lot of behavior problems? Maybe they have a tantrum. Maybe they don't want to sit down because they were just doing this thing that was fun. And then maybe you rework your schedule that way. So trial things, find what works best for you and your family. We want to motivate appropriate behavior. You know, even though we're in this for a year, people are, you know, we're getting used to it. It's still pretty unusual. Um, children won't have the same motivation that they do in school. 
part of what motivates them in school is social interaction, that they have breaks between classes where they can talk with their friends or they have that bathroom break and they're able to converse that way or they're sitting down for lunch with others. So that's missing now, they're just at home. Teachers use rewards all the time. A lot of us do the work with kids. So if it's a special snack or a treat or they can earn certain household privileges or they have a choice of a family activity or what they wanna earn, you know, find rewards. It doesn't have to be that you're going out and spending a lot of money. Just find what works for you that helps to motivate the child um, in your home. And in terms of the whole family schedule, you know, we have to think of it as the whole family system. Be realistic, you know, with what, what can be accomplished in the day what works for everybody. Children need frequent breaks. They need to change activities. Make sure you're communicating with the teacher to make sure they are on track. You know, try to find things that anchor the day then, the meals, the bedtime, you know, sitting down for breakfast and lunch and dinner and their snacks. But also be aware of what's non-negotiable. What activities have to be done at a certain time, whether that's because of school or it's because you have something with your work schedule, if you are working from home or there's something for the family, you know, find what absolutely has to be done at a certain time and then find ways to work around that. When possible, you know, remember you have different options, you have different choices. So a lot of things are outside of all of our control right now. So try to give everybody in the family time to be in charge, even the really little ones. Find something where they have a choice. You know, pick two options, give them that choice so that they feel like they have a little more power, something is in their control. So whether that's choosing the order to complete the school with, schoolwork, what they're having for lunch, or when you go outside for a walk, which direction you're going to walk, you know, find, figure out that list and then give them options. And go with the flow. Structure is good, but it's okay to rearrange the schedule when you need to. If it's a gorgeous day outside, you know, maybe spend the lunch break outside, go out for a walk. Again, a lot of this will depend on what the school schedule is and when they absolutely have to be in front of the computer, but look for the flexibility where you can. Or if they love a science lesson, spend extra time on that if you can. You know, we want kids to enjoy it. And so let's work with them to find ways to make everybody happy, right? But keep it simple and rearrange when you need to. So another thing that's, that's really important when we're thinking of virtual learning is setting up the space. Right. So we need to designate an area or two for learning and really try to keep it neat. So using a tray or basket for supplies, you know, having the computer that they're going to, to use to learn and keeping it quiet so that kids can focus. We don't want a lot of distractions. And again, I know this can be hard. We don't, not a lot of us have a lot of space. You know, some of us live in small condos, especially in Bay Harbor. So work out what you can. When we think of what an ideal learning environment is, try to keep it well lit, you know, natural light if possible, but we need light that that helps to wake up the brain that keeps you awake. Light is very important. Again, minimal distractions. So try to eliminate the non academic items or activities. So have the toys put away. I know when the year is beginning and my four year old was doing VBK virtually, we tried to set up where he had his art table, but it was in the play area. And you know, you leave him for two minutes and then he's getting out his puzzles and doing something. So trying to eliminate the distractions and having it just so that you have the schoolwork in front of you. Clear work area, you know, try to clear off the desk or the table if it's the kitchen table, having that clear spot where there's not a lot of clutter um, and that it's nice and neat. And have them in the same location each day. That is their, their desk, their chair, their space for learning. Try to organize their school supplies as much as possible and put them where the children can reach them. Because in a classroom, we really expect children to be pretty independent with a lot of things. And we wanna foster those same skills at home. And that will also help you as the parent, whether you are working from home or whether you're a stay-at-home parent and you have 5,000 other things you need to do, try to put things so that the child, regardless of the age, can get things themselves when possible. If there's different websites that they need to go to or apps, maybe putting the link directly on the desktop so that they can just go and click into it and they don't need you to type it in um, to go to that page. Try to save the passwords, whether that's writing it down on a password list or doing the automatic login. Again, just to eliminate that step of having to have you there to do it for them. If they really have attention difficulties and are just looking everywhere and it's way too distracting or if you have several kids maybe at the table, Try one of those trifold poster boards that you can get up and put around and that just eliminates everything else that they can look at and can help to 
refocus their attention. And it may take some upfront work, but if a child can navigate the virtual learning environment independently, that puts less stress on parents during the day. So the more independent the child can be, the greater flexibility um, the parents have. One really important thing too, or another important thing, is that think about what supports and accommodations the child had before. So did they have an IEP or a 504 plan? And if so, please get that out or get a copy from the school, read through it and just become familiar with it again. So you know exactly what the child was provided with in the classroom and what can be replicated at home. And find out again, what works? What was the, what, what was the teacher doing last year with them? You can always reach out to the teachers and ask, but that's really important because in a virtual learning environment, it's, you know, it's, it's challenging enough for the teacher to try to teach virtually that some things just can't be provided in a virtual format. So as a parent, really knowing uh, what your child needs is important. Does your child have ADHD? Were they diagnosed with autism, a learning disability, a language delay? And again, trying to find some things that we can use to help them in the virtual virtual environment. So I would reach out to the teachers. What did they use? Is there anything they would recommend? The school psychologist, reach out to the professional who diagnosed the child with whatever it was and try to find some other ideas and strategies that you can incorporate at home. This is also a really good opportunity for parents to check in to see if their child is struggling to learn and then voice those concerns to the teacher or the school. Because I think everyone means well, but there are a lot of times where children are not identified as having a learning disability or even an intellectual disability. And maybe they're struggling through school, but they don't get retained or they're so sweet. And so they get some extra attention and maybe passed on, but they're, they're really struggling academically. So check in, see what their grades are, see if they're able to learn the information that's provided to them or if they're getting frustrated and this is above their level or if they're turning in incorrect information over and over. And you can always ask the school to assess them. You can always request a psychoeducational evaluation, request a meeting with the school if you have concerns, do it in writing and they have 60 days and voice what your concerns are and they can look at it. I know in the state, it's, you know, they look at response to intervention first, but you are entitled to have your child evaluated with a psychoeducational evaluation. Because I can tell you, I, I see kids with medical conditions, but I see older kids who are in high school and were never diagnosed with a learning disability or an intellectual disability when in fact they have one, and then they've missed out on, on having resources all of those years. So this is a, one of the silver linings, a good opportunity to, to check in with them. You know, and know your kids. Online, lo online learning is harder, according to an education researcher at MIT, but it's different for everybody. Some kids do really well. And it's not that this is the first we've ever used virtual learning, really. We have kids with medical conditions who, who sometimes have to go to more of a virtual online learning environment before COVID, before all of this. And people respond differently. I don't think it's ideal, but for some children who cannot go to school, that's what we have. And so we have to optimize that the best we can. But even now, you know, some kids are really struggling at home with trying to keep up virtually. Some kids are doing really well. I mean, I, I had a patient recently who has a history of a learning disability and ADHD, and they're able to right now be at home with someone who sits down with them one on one to help them with the assignments and they've really made a lot of academic progress. And they've benefited so much from it that it's made the parents rethink what educational environment they do want to send them back. Um, to once, once COVID is clear. And so everybody's different. There is not a one size fit all approach and just keep that in mind and try different things and try to work, uh, find what works for your child. Okay. When we think of the younger ones, infants, toddlers, preschoolers, you know, they, they really need stimulation and things that are interactive. Reading to them is one of the best things that you can do for their brain development. Even if they don't seem to be paying attention to the book, read to them. Even, I don't care if they're three months old, great. The brain is so rich for literacy at that point. It is, has really long-term outcomes. Reading to them is great. Label things throughout the day. Talk as much as possible. Engage in back and forth conversations, even if they're just babbling or if they have a couple of words. The more they're exposed to language, whether that's English, Spanish, another language, the better, okay? Giving them objects that they stack, roll, stick their hands in, engage in sensory play. Um, 
the hands-on is great. Reviewing the alphabet verbally, visually, singing the ABCs, practicing the number, shapes, colors. You can show them how to hold the pencil, write their name, do fun and simple science experiments. There's things you can find online. If you want to order some of those kits from Amazon, you can. I think all of the prices skyrocketed last year when everybody was home for COVID. I don't know if they've come back down, but you can also look up things online and just using household products and, and doing something that's hands-on and fun. For the elementary school students, mixing up the day with indoor and outdoor activities will, will be beneficial for them. And trying to figure out, can they video conference with some of their friends because they're missing out on a lot of social interaction and it's been a long time. So are there any school assignments they can try to work on as a, as a group that way, or even if they're just doing it at the same time as one of their friends? There's a lot of virtual learning resources out there. There's, there's probably too many actually, but there are a lot out there. And rewarding the child's effort with some Something relaxing at the end of the day. You know, I think for the virtual learning resources, a lot of the schools too are having the programs like the iReady or Waterford, where they do expect the child to sit down at home to do it. There's ABC Mouse, which I think I saw an email from the library this week that that's available for free through the library. I'm not sure what ages or what grades um, it's available for free through the library for, but that's worth checking out. For the high school students and college, it might be difficult to engage. They're used to very demanding schedules and extracurricular activities if they were on, I don't know, the debate team, but also, you know, cheerleading or basketball or, or any other activity. A lot of that has come to a halt or it's very different or if they're doing virtual learning, they may not be participating in those activities this year. And that's a big part of high school for a lot of kids. So that's pretty different now. So helping them stay connected virtually, again, to complete assignments, engage in projects, trying to make sure they still have that social connection even if it's virtual. And then balance the independence around responsibilities from school. You know, check in at agreed upon times to ensure they're keeping up, but recognize that they probably want privacy and they probably want independence at times. But again, if they're already behind, we don't wanna just criticize or get down on them or make them feel worse about themselves, right? It's a good opportunity to just reset, find a new tone for the work ahead try to figure out something else that works. Okay, they're struggling. Whatever they've been doing is not working. Try to maybe identify why if you can, and then let's figure out a new path forward. Again, you can work with their, their teacher on that, the school psychologist, virtual, whatever resources, try to figure out what does work for them. And that's another silver lining. You can maybe really help figure out how your child learns and what's going to benefit them. Um, going forward. And again, let them know this is a new normal for everybody. <laughs> Excuse me, everyone is trying to adjust here. And so being understanding of that is really important. You know, communicate, don't be afraid to ask the child's teacher questions. What's the most essential component of a virtual school day? Who's available for support? Who do we call? What's the best way to communicate with the teacher? All of these, these things are important as a parent. I know I struggled with this with my four-year-old at the beginning of the school year when we couldn't log on and the Zoom link wasn't working. And how do I email? You know, it's it can be a lot. So hopefully at this point you know, but if not, you know, try to find that out. Online doesn't necessarily equal better. There's a lot of stuff out there online, but it can be really overwhelming. So start small, start with your parent community and the teacher and kind of go from there and be careful about what resources you trust online as well. Okay, It's not just academics though, right? I think a lot of people realize this. We need to pay attention to how children are coping, what their mood is like, what they're worried about, and checking with parents as well. Emotional well-being can impact the educational performance, learning, overall development, how the children view themselves, their beliefs and perceptions about their intelligence and their abilities also impacts their cognitive functioning and learning. If, if they're really worried or they're getting depressed or they just think, I can't do this, I'm no good, um, everybody else is doing this so much better than I am, that's going to impact their ability to pay attention or to organize things and to focus. So all of this stuff is tied together. There's this idea that kids are behind or there's catching up to do, but Rather than focus on learning loss, help children process what they've learned or experienced, talk about positive things, and remember that children are listening. They're listening to how we adults are framing this. And so if you were complaining about COVID and the masks and, oh, this stinks that we still have to do this virtual learning, this is so terrible, they're listening. And that's how they're going to interpret 
this situation. So if you can reframe that, at least in front of them, if you need to take a break and step away and go in your bathroom or your closet and just scream for a moment and let it out, do it. But in front of the kids, try to keep it together. Try to find the silver linings. Try to find what's fun about this. You know, this is great. We're going to get back to this. Um, and try not to say, oh, I know you don't want to do this. I know you hate this, but we have to do it anyways. Well, then you're setting the tone that they, they shouldn't enjoy it. Try to think about what you're saying and how you're saying it to them. And that will impact what your children perceive and how they view situations. There definitely are, are difficulties that we're seeing. So there's the NBC News and Challenge Success Study. So Challenge Success is a nonprofit. It's based out of Stanford. It's involved with um, how children learn and education. And they found that remote students are more stressed than their peers in the classroom. So they looked at 10,000 students surveyed last fall, 2020, from 12 high schools around the country, Arizona, Texas, New York, the Midwest, they had already been doing studies. So they had 13,000 students from fall 2019 as comparison. So it wasn't just that they were asking them to reflect back, which can sometimes cause the good old days bias where you think, oh, this is so terrible. And it was perfect before. They did have some data from students before. So over half reported feeling more stressed about school in 2020 than previously. And this was more pronounced though among the remote learners. So the kids who are doing the virtual learning. When asked about how stress levels have changed since before the pandemic, 56.4% say stress levels have increased. 30.6% said they stayed the same and 13% decreased. And then when we look at exhaustion, headaches, insomnia, and other stress-related ailments, 84% of remote students endorsed one or more of these things. 82% of students who were doing the hybrid model where they're in the classroom on some days and virtual learning the other endorsed some. And 78% of students in class full-time endorsed them. So more remote students did. Though if you look at this, there are a lot of students struggling. This is, these are high numbers even being in the classroom, it does not mean that it's stress-free. There's still a lot going on. They're all wearing masks, they're social distancing, there's a lot of restrictions. It is, it is tough out there for everybody. When asked if they were purposefully or fully engaged in school, back in 2019, 44.5% said yes, and that number has now fallen to 35.7%, which is a significant drop. With remote students, they were less likely to say that they had an adult that they could go to with a personal problem. They were slightly more likely to worry about grades, and there was an average. They spent an average of ninety more minutes of homework per week. So they were doing more, even though it's virtual learning. Students learn less remotely, um, especially those with disabilities or from low-income families. That is what the research is saying at this point. And again, I think with the disabilities, we think back to the IEP and the 504 and what they were able to receive in school. You know, maybe they were receiving instruction in a resource room where they were able to get more one on one attention or they were taught in a specialized manner, something different than what they would be getting in just the typical classroom setting. What are they getting now? And so that's really, really difficult. And other children were attending after school programs where they were sitting down and getting help with homework. Now, maybe they aren't. So Again, things are very different. There have also been a lot of spikes in depression and anxiety in children and parents. So this is not easy. I, I've seen mixed information about spikes in divorce rates. So I've heard people mention that. When I was looking up the data, I found some that said across around the world, there have been an increased number of divorces. But in terms of the country, there haven't been. I think in Arizona, they did actually have more. Um, and some people are saying, you know, at first it, it could be that offices were closed or they weren't going to file or the fact that there is financial implications to filing for divorce. So I think there's different factors and it hasn't been pieced apart yet, but I do think there's more tension um, and there is a lot going on that affects the family as a whole, not just kids or parents. Okay. So red flags to look for with the kids though. For pre-K and kindergarten, they may appear sleepy they may start to withdraw from their friends or from typical routines. They may display a reluctance to attend school or participate in activities that they typically enjoy. They may be more clingy than usual, or they may have behavioral regression where they're thumb sucking or they're starting to, you know, pee their pants again or having separation anxiety. So these are all red flags that say, you know, emotionally, there's, there may be something more here with how they're coping and how they're adjusting right now. With the elementary school kids, things we look for are irritability, aggressiveness, whether they get really quiet and keep to themselves or just want to sit 
sit alone, maybe in their bedroom. They could also be clingy, starting having nightmares, school avoidance, again, withdrawing from activities and friends, or maybe worrying about family members or friends as well, especially if children are sitting around, if you're watching the evening news, the evening news can be pretty scary sometimes in what they show. And I think we as adults need to know realistically what's going on, but try to keep in mind what your children are watching and how they're able to interpret that information. Okay, middle and high school kids, what we tend to see are sleep and eating disturbances, physical complaints, they start to have a headache, or they're tired, delinquent behavior, they may be acting out, pushing the boundaries more, increase in conflicts, difficulty, concentrating, they're just easy, easily agitated. So all of these are red flags that there could be more of an emotional component. So how do we help? You know, you want to show care by, by noticing the changes in behavior, but trying not to push it. You know, something along the lines of, you don't seem like yourself lately. You know, is there something going on? But try to do more listening than talking. And it may be a matter of letting your child know that you're there for them, but waiting until they're, they want to talk about it. Okay. Provide opportunities, especially for younger kids to express their feelings with writing or drawing or talking. Maybe older kids want to start to keep a journal. And that should be their private space that they can share with you if they'd like. Please don't go read their journal. <laughs> um, but trying to remain calm in front of them. Again, think about how what you're talking about and how you're framing the situation. Keep to routines as much as possible. Again, knowing what to expect can decrease anxiety. But don't be afraid to seek support from a mental health professional if you need to. A lot of um, therapists and psychologists are providing telehealth services. So if you're keeping your child at home because you're worried about COVID and rightfully so, you know, you can also have telehealth appointments and find a way to address this. You don't necessarily have to go talk to someone. Although if you do want to, people are open as well. Okay. And try to try to find other ways that you can just make this time more fun. Hopefully we will not have to deal with another global pandemic. So how can we capitalize on this time? Maybe doing passion projects, especially when you have flexibility in your schedule. Ask your children what they want to learn. Maybe you have that ukulele sitting around from a trip you took to Hawaii and brought back and never learned how to play and it's just been a decoration. Maybe they want to learn how to paint like, you know, Bob Ross or something. Maybe they want to cook things with you. You can, they can help with dinner prep, finding cooking that's age appropriate for them. So try to find something that they care about. That could be something you do together or it could be something that they do on their own. And if it's time that they do it on their own, then bonus, you also have some more time to yourself for a little of your own self-care because we all need self-care right now. Remember, exercise and movement is so important for so many things. And especially now when children are sitting at home in front of a screen doing virtual learning. So shake the sillies out. Everybody needs movement breaks, adults and kids. So try to let go of the pressure, take some downtime, whether that's just in the house, you put music on, you dance around, going out for a walk, however you wanna do it. There's different things online, Cosmic Kids Yoga, um, has been a big hit in our family. And I know with a lot of my nieces and nephews, so that's something that you can stream for free on YouTube. UNICEF Kid Power is another one. They have the free videos. And that one is really cool. They have this thing, you, you sign up for free for an account and you kind of earn these chips or these points. And then that goes to something. So it's helping the kids learn that they're actually doing something good too for the community and the world by doing this exercise. So I think the one option is they donate these, it donates coins to the local food bank through UNICEF or providing PPE to the community, or there's also global things as well. So that's a cool little tie-in. And you could use that as a, another lesson in world events. There's also this Fit Boost activity one. And that one is, it's kind of cool. You go on and it has these three cards and there's a warm up, a um, more of the exercise one, and then the cool down. But it's, they have a timer. It's just very brief and it shows you what to do and it mixes it up. So it might be like, pretend you're dribbling and then shooting a basket and then you run in place and then you stretch for the cool down. So there's different things. We also live in Florida, take advantage of the weather, walking, running, biking, swimming, whatever you wanna do, it's good to be outside. It's gonna have some sunshine. You know, and remember this is a challenge for teachers as well. It's not just parents. So we have the pre parents, parents who are preparing for the new school year and felt like they had no idea what's going on. I'm married to a teacher. I feel like I had no idea what was happening with the virtual learning at the beginning. But also with teachers, they didn't go to school for this. And some teachers are in the classroom. They're teaching in person and they're teaching virtually. They're trying to juggle these different types of instruction. And then 
if you have a teacher who's been a teacher for 15 years, they pretty much have their lesson plan set. But all of a sudden, everyone has to rework everything, right? Because someone's in sixth grade virtual learning now where they may not be learning as much and they're going to start seventh grade and there's even more of a gap than what we would see after a typical summer. So teachers are having to rework lesson plans and figure out where the kids are and there's such difference. So this is really, everybody is really in this boat together. Okay, but be forgiving. How involved can you really be? What are your capabilities? You know, everybody, even a year in, I think we're still figuring this out. Talk with your school if you need more flexibility for any reason, emotional or financial. Um, again, just really trying to think it's okay. We do not have to be perfect in this. We will do our best. If you don't have time to sit down and do a project with, it, with your child that needed to be done and it needed parent involvement, just communicate with the teacher. We've had to do that. I mean, there were times where I thought, oh my goodness, sorry, this VPK assignment did not get done. I can't help it. We will do it next week or over the weekend. Just try to communicate. Everybody's going through this, okay? And find silver linings wherever you can. More family time together. Maybe if you have a young one at home who's not in daycare yet and you're working from home, catching a milestone that you may otherwise have missed or teaching your child skill or making memories that your child will remember. You know, there's <coughs> there are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of silver linings as well if you look for them. I really love Brene Brown in terms of things I do for my own mental health, my own self-care, just checking in. She has so many good books. This is just a little one with her 10 guideposts for wholehearted living from the gifts of imperfection. So thinking of letting go of what people think, cultivating authenticity, letting go of perfectionism, cultivating self-compassion, and you can go on and on. Her books are at the library. I know I've gotten them out several times. We're often at the library. But check in with yourself as well. Our own self-care, our own mental health is important. And just, again, trying to be realistic with expectations for everybody at the moment. There's this website that I think has been helpful. This is called, it's Pandemic Parenting. There are two psychologists who are also mothers that started this, this platform and they have some free webinars on here that I think are just, are useful in helping to normalize this and also providing some realistic tips for all of us going through this. Okay. And sorry, that went a little bit longer than I planned, but that is all. So I hope that was um, beneficial or you found something helpful out of that. And this is from Joe DiMaggio. So if anyone has any questions, I think we do have a little bit of time. Um, you can let me know. I don't know how to change hosting duties. Let's see. Regina, I switch the host back to you. You can let me know if that's not correct. Okay, but if nobody has any questions, then I think that is all for today.